The United Nations has said progress toward global biodiversity targets has been insufficient. At the virtual UN summit on biodiversity, what new commitments are countries making to improve the relationship between man and nature? What has China been doing to grow in an equal, friendly way? And 25 years after the landmark Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, which imagined a world where women can exercise their freedoms and realize their rights, how much closer is the world to gender equality? Welcome to The Point, coming to you from Beijing. I'm Wang Guan, sitting in for Liu Xin. Leaders at the virtual United Nations Summit on Biodiversity on Wednesday focused on the degradation of the environment. The UN says progress on the biodiversity targets set over the last decade has been insufficient, and this summit presents an opportunity to improve the relationship between man and nature. Given Chinese President Xi Jinping was one of the featured speakers at the summit, how has China fared in meeting its own goals? What new commitments can China make? And what has COVID-19 revealed about the human's relationship with nature, with some linking the pandemic to the destruction of ecosystems and species? I'm joined in Beijing by Thomas Gill, attorney and environmental issues advisor to former U.S. President Bill Clinton, and Li Binbin, assistant professor of environmental science and at Duke Kunshan University. Uh, welcome to both of you. Um, Thomas, uh, can I start with you? Biodiversity. I mean... This concept encompasses so many things, right? Um, it does. But to people, average people like you and me, um, can you explain to them why this is so important, why this is relevant to them and to their lives? Well, I think that you know, biodiversity is an um, important factor in keeping the uh, breadth of the ecosystem available to us. We have multiple species that um, interact with one another in many, many ways from um, the, the fungi and um, plant species, animal species, um, insect species that all work in very complex uh, web of life. So when we uh, take one of these parts out of the web, we weaken the entire web and we don't know what unintended consequences can occur in this way. As man increases their footprint around the world, we keep intruding on the other species' habitat and then they have to are forced to realign in some way that may create some issues um, for their bio community as well as our eco community. Right, uh, Professor Lee, talking about biodiversity, some people are like, you know, uh, this concept is so abstract, is so uh, untang intangible. Uh, you know, it doesn't concern me. Uh, what would you say to those people? What does biodiversity really mean? So actually biodiversity is around you and when we talk about biodiversity actually it has three levels the genetic diversity species diversity and ecosystem diversity so when people first perceive like biodiversity mainly they think about species which is okay because this is a concept that can be perceived by most of the people however if you look at around you the birds flying around they're part of the biodiversity and the places you travel to for example um, Yellowstone, Antarctica, Himalayas, there are also different ecosystems. So actually it is just in your environment and it just how to connect people's daily life with biodiversity. I think part of the responsibility actually relies on researchers how we can prove more linkage closely to their daily life. For example, how biodiversity connects to people's health and this is what we're looking at now. So then people can perceive it as air pollution, water pollution, so they have better understanding how the reduction in biodiversity actually can influence their life, their health, and also the ecosystem services they have enjoyed. Sure, it can be relevant to um, many, if not all of us. Uh, the United Nations said that um, as we approach the end of UN decade on biodiversity, that means from 2011 to 2020, progress towards global biodiversity targets, including those of the Sustainable Development Goals, has been insufficient. Um, Thomas, uh, just how far behind are we and why? Well, we're, we're quite a ways be behind. I think we, we've barely gotten started because we've had very weak um, clarification on what our objective are. 
Um, in business, you say that you can't manage what you can't measure. And we haven't found good tools to be able to measure how we move forward along on it. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned the sustainable development goals from the United Nations because sustainability goal 14 and 15 do address the aquatic and terrestrial life. And hopefully that will give some specific guidance um, to help to set the goals and find the ways to accomplish the protection and enhancement of the, of the biodiverse communities that we need to protect. Right. Uh, Professor Lee, let me uh, share with our audience some uh, figures here. According to the World Wildlife Fund, there has been a 60% decline in mammal, bird, fish, uh, reptile, and, uh, and other populations over the past 40 years. Also, more than 32,000 species are on the verge of extinction. Uh, can you tell us just how serious is the situation that we're facing right now? So we always thought there is a background extinction rate. So without humans, naturally there are extinctions. However, because of human disturbances, actually the extinction rate has been raised to 100 to 1,000 times than the background extinction rate. So basically because of human activities, we're facing the sixth mass extinction. So which means more than like 70% of the species can go extinct in a short time if we're doing nothing. So that actually related to what Tommy has mentioned because the interaction between species are really important and that actually provides a lot of resilience of our society and resistance to potential disturbances. For example, climate change, storms, floodings, and if we do not have these stable interactions between species and our ecosystems, which are played by the biodiversity, and then we're basically losing the buffer to all the disasters that we have. So can we have development or have a bright future without these species or biodiversity? The answer is a definitely no. Right, Professor Lee, but many people are arguing that uh, countries, societies need to evolve, need to industrialize, they need, you know, the trees to make papers, uh, they need to, uh, you know, uh, have food on the table. How do you see the balance between economic development uh, and the right of countries to develop versus protecting the ecosystem? Yeah, I think there is a long debate about these two aspects, whether they're in conflicts or can they go hand in hand. I think uh, with more knowledge and understanding of how the nature is working, we find more solutions that can be win-win for both sides. So if we manage the natural resources well, we can use it efficiently and sustainably, so we're not depleting some natural resources. For example, some forests, the timber we extract, if we deforest them in a short time and do not allow them to regenerate, and we lose the income for the next decade or next 100 years. So basically, this is not good for our economic growth. So I think the right thing to do uh, so far is to look at how to manage these resources and how to use it in a sustainable way mm -hmm. and both the economic, uh, economic development can be achieved and also the conservation of nature can be achieved as well. I mean, Tom, how do you look at this balance, the need to develop economically and versus the need to protect the environment? Well, I think the professor, you know, hit it very accurately that it is a, a balance to do and there are great losses when you um, just take, take, take from the environment. Um, when you set it up in a sustainable fashion, then you are, be ab you are able to accomplish both the economic growth and have it um, continue to give back to your society year after year. Uh, we do have greater impacts too, and how to balance that is difficult when we look at the Amazon jungle and some of the um, habitat loss that's there and just the amount of tree species that are lost for the um, uh, carbon dioxide sequestering um, that affects the entire globe. So we have uh, unique individual um, interests country by country, but then those also go into a global impact and we need to find the way to balance that and perhaps compensate for those areas that 
um, have a, a worldwide impact to be able to help offset any losses that they might have as a, as a global benefit. Right. Hopefully, policymakers uh, will heed uh, you know, the, advice, the advice from you both. Uh, let's talk about China, its opportunities and challenges. China, as one of the mega biodiversity countries in the world and also one of the countries with uh, the most threatened biodiversity, has integrated this concept into some of its economic and social strategies, such as the 13th five-year plan from 2016 to 2020. Uh, the number of national level nature reserves has risen from less than 250 uh, a decade ago to almost 500 in 2018. And also satellite data shows that more than 25% of the newly added green space in the world between 2000 and 2017 was in China, uh, making it the largest contributor to the greening of the global landscape. Uh, in June this year, China unveiled a 15-year comprehensive plan for its ecosystem management. Um, I'll show you some of those plans. By 2035, China aims to increase its forest to cover a quarter of China's land area and to cover 60% of grasslands with vegetation, to protect 60% of its wetlands and to treat 75% of recoverable sandy land with over half of 56 million hectares of degraded land newly treated to safeguard at least 35% of the country's natural coastlines and to have nature reserves account for over 18% of the territorial land. That is, of course, a very ambitious goal. Professor uh, Li, how do you see that those goals becoming a reality? What are the challenges? Yeah, at first, I'm really impressed by all of this because when first came back from the States, when compared China to other countries, I'm really impressed of what China are doing now, especially as environments for the nature. It's always treated as public goods, so sometimes it cannot fully operate it through market, and then you need policy and laws to be in place to ensure it is well managed. And especially a lot of new policies in the recent 10 years from China actually give the nature a chance to recover and also help us to protect some areas that are really important. And the main challenge, of course, is still the balance between economic growth and then how we want to achieve these goals. Because a lot of the goals are very ambitious and even for other countries, they haven't achieved that goal. For example, China has pre, uh, protected 18% of its land and it's above the RG target 11. If we look at other countries, many of them haven't like, uh, like achieved this goal, but China has. But then we have a lot of people, we have a lot of need to develop, and then there's a lot of local issues related to how we deal with the local development. And the people who are not in power have to ensure them to get the right to develop, and also let people to understand why it is important, mm -hmm. not just implementing policy and laws, but actually have the support from the public, and actually let biodiversity conservation be some of the topics people can talk about on the table, on mm -hmm. the dinner table, instead of just listen through some news. Right. Uh, Thomas, talking about COVID-19 pandemic, some people uh, went as far as blaming a worsening ecosystem uh, for you know, the spread of the virus. How do you see the correlation between COVID-19 and uh, the worsening ecosystem? Well, one of the you know, main um, impacts on it was it's um, allegedly traced to the um, bat caves and the exposure to the guano and other problems there. And those aren't necessarily human habitats that we need to invade. Um, I think that this is a major problem that when we have animal species that have very unique niches, but then we go and invade into those or pull those animals into our um, human sphere, that th it creates a potential for disaster, as we've seen. Um, so I think that we have to respect each um, unique habitat that's out there and try to protect each species as they, as they go. Um, so I think that that is one, it's the, um, as we talked about, the problem with uh, population expanding and taking more space and, and, and driving um, um, other um, creatures out of their habitats. It creates um, complex issues that we don't know how, what the ramifications will be from that. So again, we have mm -hmm. to respect each of the habitats and try to 
uh, allow them to exist independently from ourselves. Indeed. Uh, thank you so much uh, to both of you for flagging those issues and for offering your uh, solutions to those uh, problems. Thank you very much, um, Professor Li Bingbing, Environmental Science at Duke Kunshan University, and also Thomas uh, Gill, attorney and former Environmental Issues Advisor to former U.S. President Bill Clinton.